living. If you are new around here, my name is Esther and I try to sew stuff that supports a slow lifestyle. In this video, I'll talk you through the basics of a domestic sewing machine. So something like this right here. They're pretty common in households and you can get them at very affordable prices nowadays, but unfortunately it's a lot harder to try and get lessons or try and really learn how to use a machine well and properly. So that's what I'm hoping to achieve in the next few videos that I'm going to upload. This first one here, I'm going to talk through the basic parts that make up the sewing machine, which will help you navigate changing settings, working with different fabrics, and just being able to start using a machine from scratch. If you haven't been taught or shown these things, it can be very daunting to pick up a machine for the first time and not know where to begin. So this is what I'm hoping to really help you in this video. The best way to explain all, all the bits and bobs of a sewing machine is to do it as you go. So basically, if you follow me along, through this video, we will take you all the way from threading up your machine at the very beginning, winding the bobbin, getting that in place, and then learning how to adjust some of the common settings that you will need to learn in order to sort of adjust your stitch to be perfect for the type of fabric that you are using. So when you first get your machine, of course, you have the main body of the machine, and then you should also have the parts which allow you to plug it in to an electric socket and the pedal. They easily attach to the machine just on the side or on the back using one of these plugs, and it's pretty easy to figure out where it goes because there should only really be one sort of plug or place to plug it into. You pop the entire pedal on the floor, at a really comfortable position. So you should be sitting on a chair and popping the pedal right under where your foot pretty naturally sits. You don't wanna be reaching forward or like feeling really crammed where the pedal is. You just want it to be sitting really nice and comfortably under your foot. One of the first things that I would tell you about this is how to treat your foot pedal with kindness. <laughs> I see a lot of people using a sewing machine for the first time and they basically slam down on the pedal, you know, expecting the machine to go. And it's really not the best way to go about it. So my first bit of advice for using a foot pedal like this is that you should treat it sort of like a car. So when you're accelerating on the car, very rarely, unless you're doing a drag or something, are you going to put your pedal to the floor. It's not going to be like that hard action when you slam it down. You're actually going to like, you know, ease into it. You get a feel for the car. It's the same with the machine. You can hear the noise because there's, there's a little motor inside the machine that operates it. And so if you slam down on your machine, you're just going to hear this like really loud whirling noise. And that's always a red flag because <laughs> your machine needs to be treated with love and care. That is the best way to learn how to control the machine as well, because when you are sewing garments, or anything really, you really need to have control over your machine. And a lot of that control comes from the foot pedal. So being able to ease into it, to back off when you wanna slow down, and especially to stop, as well as to ease into it again, um, you really need to master this little guy and, <laughs> and treat him with a little bit of respect. First of all, we'll find a bit of scrap fabric that you can use to do lots of little trials on. I'm just using a scrap from an old bed sheet. Find something that does not have stretch. So with this, I'm pulling it like this and it's not stretching at all. This is just called a woven fabric and it really is the easiest type of fabric to handle in the very beginning. I suggest steering clear of anything that's gonna make this really difficult for a beginner. Really want a really basic fabric to begin with and not something complex. Choose a mid to lightweight fabric, not something like silk, not something like organza or tulle or anything slippery. Choose something that would just sit really nice and flat because of course you always sew with two layers. So you always test your sewing machine on two layers of fabric. When you wanna test out fabric, start from the left side. So this was the first one that I did here. And then as I made adjustments, I sewed it next to it. If you've got a big piece of fabric like this, the last thing you wanna do is just stuff like sew straight through the middle. It doesn't really make any sense and it also wastes the fabric while you're at it. So the best way is to just begin with one straight line. This is approximately two centimeters from the edge of the left-hand side. Then as you go, you can move along and do more tests on the same piece of fabric and see what little things need to be adjusted as you go along. We're actually gonna start with winding up a bobbin first. If you've never seen one before, 
This is a bobbin. The ones with your machine might look a bit different, they might be see-through, um, but they all are the same size, they're pretty standard unless you have a very specialised machine. You can generally use the same type of bobbin for all machines. The reason why I'm going to show you how to thread up a bobbin first is because with domestic machines you cannot have the machine threaded up to the needle and to the bobbin at the same time. You have to pick one or the other. So before I show you how we're going to thread up the machine through the needle so that you can start sewing, we actually have to wind up the bobbin first. The way that a sewing machine works is that it has an upper thread and a lower thread. The bobbin leaves a little trail underneath the machine and the top thread is what goes up and down and catches on that bit of thread on the bobbin so that you form stitches. My bobbin winder sits on top of the machine and it's actually this tiny little part up here. You should be able to click it into place or it should sit pretty nice and flush and then your machine should also have instructions for how to thread your bobbin winder. I'll do my best to explain how I thread mine up. So we follow the numbers. So this is number one, going through that tiny little loop on the top there. Number two is a little bit more tricky. It's a little tiny tension wheel. And the instructions again show how I need to pass underneath the wheel and then twirl it around towards the right. The only thing is to make sure that you give your threads a little tug because they need to sit inside that tension wheel, not just floating around the outside. Once you've done that, then you just have to wind the rest of the thread around your bobbin, making sure you follow the instructions on your machine because there is a correct way. For my bobbin winder, it's to wind it clockwise. And then there's a tiny little lip there which allows you to wind the thread around and clip it off so that there's no extra little bits hanging off. And then to activate the bobbin winder, clip it to the right. Now you should be able to use the foot pedal and the bobbin winder should start to turn. As long as you are pressing down on the foot pedal, the bobbin winder should continue to take up yarn until it's full. Most bobbin winders also stop by themselves. So whenever your bobbin stops winding, is usually when it's full and at that point you can snip it off, take it off the winder and pop it in its little home under where the needle sits. There is a specific way to put the bobbin inside the bobbin holder. For my machine there's a little diagram and it shows me which way the thread has to come off the bobbin for it to be popped in. This does make a difference so make sure that you check your machine um, whether it should come off this way or if it should come off that way. And then there's a little part on the bobbin which allows you to trace along it and then it clips the end of the thread so that the bobbin tail is not too long. Your machine should have a little cover that sort of covers that area where the bobbin is sitting, uh, but I have lost mine and I have no idea what I've done with it. So this whole time I've had this machine for about 10 years now um, and I've just been sewing without it so it's not essential it does sometimes get in the way if I manage to jam my machine somehow but otherwise just pop that little there should be a tiny little clip that you can push which releases the lid and then you can pop your bobbin inside in the correct direction and then pop the lid back on and click it into place. When you've done that your machine will automatically pick up the bobbin thread as soon as you start sewing. Unless your machine has an automatic thread cutter, when you pull your fabric away, when you finish sewing, you'll see both the bobbin thread and the needle thread. So just trim them both off like so, and then pull both of the threads underneath your foot towards the back of the machine every time you begin a new seam. So you really only need to take the bobbin out and put it back in if your bobbin runs out of thread. One of the very first things you will encounter at this point is that we need to thread up the machine. This can be kind of daunting because there are lots of little bits and bobs that you need to thread properly around so that your machine operates correctly and so that you don't get any um, messy stitches or knots or things like that. Usually when something goes wrong, um, when you're sewing normally and all of a sudden something happens or all of a sudden there's a missed stitch, um, it usually is because you've missed something tiny in the threading process. Now my machine and a lot of machines these days have a numbered system which you can follow to help thread your machine. It does take a bit of practice but as you'll come to learn most machines are threaded up in a very very similar if not exactly the same way. I don't know why there are so many little bits and bobs that you need to sort of go around. Some bits might seem irrelevant and you wonder how does this actually 
you know, make a difference when the thread's going through the machine, but they're there for a reason and every little bit really does count. So when you skip something or you've missed something or something goes out of place, it really does play up with your machine. So we need to make sure that we hit every single one of those bits and bobs that are intended as you thread your machine up. So use a little spool of thread, pop it in the top, there should be a place for it to be held. And then the first part of threading the machine, labelled number one, is a tiny little metal loop which your thread passes through. It will help guide the thread out from the spool towards number two. At number two is a part of the machine where the thread needs to follow around. It simply sits around this chiselled out part of the machine. It's sort of shaped that way so that the thread travels around the back of it and then follows that groove down to number three. Number three is another shaped part of the machine where the thread must go around it before travelling up again to number four. Number four can get a little bit tricky because it involves hooking the thread around this little silver hook. It sits on the inside of the machine and you can move that hook by using the turning wheel that's on the right side of the machine, which I'll talk you through a lot more in depth later. But just for now, use that turning wheel to turn it a little bit towards you until you can see that little silver hook at the very top there. Then carefully place your thread around the hook from right to left and then follow the groove down to number five. When you get down towards the needle, there should be a tiny little latch, not a latch, it's like a little um, hooky bit. And the thread sits behind that and then it threads in to the needle. The needle should be threaded from front to back and then pull it to sit towards the back of the machine. The last thing you need is for the threads and stuff to be around the front, messing things up before you've even begun sewing. So the best way is to direct the thread towards the back so that it's out of the way. Usually leave around 10 centimeters um, so that it's sitting comfortably towards the back of the machine and there's no risk of losing your thread when you begin sewing. Each time we want to start a new seam on a sewing machine, your presser foot should be up. There should be a tiny little, not a tiny, it's like a normal size lever that allows you to lift the foot up and down. You should have it up so that you can slide your two layers of fabric underneath. It makes a lot of sense for the foot to be up because if it's down, you simply won't be able to put your fabric underneath the machine and you'll be wondering what you're doing wrong. In the same way, if you don't put your foot down while you are sewing, the machine simply won't catch, it won't be sitting in the correct position and you'll just get knotting on the back like this. You will get very used to raising and lowering the foot each time um, and just in the same way as when you're beginning sewing, when you're finishing sewing, you'll figure out that something is wrong because you won't be able to get your fabric out from the machine unless you lift your foot up. You can actually get different feet that help you perform different functions with a sewing machine. So in this case, it is attached by a little screw on the side and you just use a little screwdriver to loosen or tighten that screw each time you want to change the foot. In the same way, you can get different needle types depending on the type of fabric. Um, heavier fabrics will use a thicker needle and lighter fabrics will require a lighter needle. So in the same way as the foot is removed and put back on, there's a little screw and you just use a screwdriver to remove it and pop it back in. You will notice that the top of the needle has a flat side, so most of it is round, but there is one edge that is flat, and that flat edge faces towards the back of the machine. You'll find that when you're trying to pop the needle back in, it probably won't sit properly, properly in place unless that flat bit is facing towards the back, and then you should be able to fit it in there and tighten the screw again. This helps to ensure that the eye of the needle is facing squarely forwards. Now that we have a bobbin in its bobbin case and we have threaded up the machine, we can move on to one of the first settings that is very standard for a machine. That is the stitch type. So my machine comes with around 21 different stitch types and I use about three of them. So the most common one is the straight stitch and that is the sort of basic stitch that I'm sure you can imagine. The other one that I use quite regularly is the zigzag stitch how I change my stitch type is via this uh, knob on the side. It's on the right hand side and basically when I tap that forward or back I can see the little numbers changing here which are showing me which type of stitch I have. Maybe yours is a turning wheel which has the little stitches on it so just adjust that setting to the basic straight stitch. 
One thing that is pretty important to know is the turning wheel. So this is almost always located on the top right hand side and you need to remember to only turn this towards you. So that's anti-clockwise. I'm not sure why we have to turn it towards us, but apparently it's like a golden rule of sewing. It must have something to do with how the machine is threaded up and the mechanics of it. But basically, whenever you use this wheel, you should only turn it towards you. What it does is it basically hand operates the machine. So usually when we're sewing, you press down on this and the machine, the needle will go up and down. In the same way, if we use the turning wheel and we keep turning it towards us, you'll see the needle going up and down and up and down. So basically we use this when we want to position the needle at the right height to begin sewing. And the right height is the highest possible position. And that's where you can see this metal sort of hook thing at the very top here. And that's the point at which we can pop our fabric down, pop the foot down and start sewing. Again, when you finish sewing, the turning wheel helps us to loosen the thread a bit. If you're finding that you release the foot and you're trying to yank your fabric out but it's stuck, use the turning wheel again towards you and it will loosen up the threads so that it should release the threads and you should be able to remove your fabric without any resistance. Using the turning wheel also lifts the needle out of the fabric. So of course you won't be able to remove your fabric unless you've removed the needle out of it. Okay, so there's a bit of an order of process that we must go through whenever we're starting to sew something and whenever we're finishing sewing something. Your presser foot should already be up. Um, if it's not, pop it up now. And this is how the process begins. With the presser foot up, you can then place your fabric underneath, pop the presser foot down, and then use the turning wheel to turn this little thing to its highest position. When you've done that, you are then ready to start sewing and you can press on your foot pedal and it should begin sewing. Now, when you've stopped sewing or you're at the end of your line of sewing, we reverse this process. So take your foot off the foot pedal to stop sewing. Use the turning wheel again towards you to raise the needle to its highest position and then release the presser foot and then take your fabric away. Clip both of your threads and move them towards the back of the machine underneath the foot and then you'll be ready to start sewing another seam. So fabric in, presser foot down, turning wheel up to the highest position, start sewing, stop sewing, turn the wheel, presser foot up, take your fabric away. You do that every single time. Um, the reason is because domestic machines can be temperamental. If you don't use your turning wheel appropriately uh, before and after you're, finished, you're sewing a seam, uh, your machine might be in the middle of a stitch. And when you try to start sewing again, it, it just won't catch properly or it's not beginning at the right position. And so in order to overcome any problems or potential problems, the easiest way is to get your turning wheel, use it to position your needle at the highest point and then you should be good to go. Let's give it a test run. After my first test run, I could see that, well, actually I fabricated this. I turned the tension all the way down to like zero so that I could show you what it looks like when something doesn't have the correct tension. So it might have looked fine from the front, but on the back here, you can see I've purposely used the black as the top thread and that copper color as the under thread. And you can really see way too much of the black thread coming through the underside. And when you pull the seam apart, it looks very, very loose. If this was a garment, you'd be able to see all the threads coming through, which is not right. The trick to changing tension really is to go a little bit at a time. So for example, mine has numbers from I think zero to 10. So I'd go maybe from a one to a two or a two to a three. I would not go from a one to a seven because that's much too drastic a change for the machine to handle and won't help the situation. 
So after changing my tension from a one to a two, I then tested it again and had a look at the stitches. I still wasn't very happy with them. So again, I changed the tension from a two to a three, and then I continued this until I was really happy with the result. When I opened up the seam, I couldn't see the thread anymore, perhaps just a tiny bit. And that's because I purposely used contrasting thread colors so you can really clearly see the stitches. But if they were in a matching color to the fabric, you really wouldn't be able to see them at all. The fabric also isn't bunched up or anything like that it shouldn't be too tight that way and of course the stitches are sitting nice and flat on both sides the last standard setting to talk about is stitch length and the general rule of thumb is to have it on 2.5 which means that you get about four stitches per centimeter after doing all the trials on my pieces of fabric I found that the stitch was a tiny bit too big for my liking for this particular fabric and so I actually made it down to two which is that top line of stitching there I think that that looked neater compared to the other stitches but that could just be my personal preference but when it comes to using thicker fabrics in your machine you will find that it makes a more significant difference so I'm going to use this really thick fleece to show you um, how it's going to make a difference with stitch length after sewing one single line on the same setting that I had sewed on the linen, you can see that the stitches almost look very messy because they're very cramped together. And also the stitching is really digging into the fleece. It's sort of disappearing into the fleece, which shows me that the stitch length and possibly the tension as well is a bit too high. So instead of making it four or five stitches per centimeter, I increased my stitch length to just above a three, which means that I'd only get about three stitches per centimeter. And you can really see the difference on that top line of stitching. It's no longer really digging into the fabric, but also when you open the seam, you still can't see the stitches. So to me, that looks like it's sitting pretty well. The last thing to master so that you're ready to take on some sewing projects is this reverse or back stitch button. Basically, whenever you press that down and you are sewing, the machine will sew in reverse. We use this to help seal off seams. So here I have not used a back stitch or a reverse and the seams will simply pull away at the edge because I haven't tied a knot or anything like that. You certainly don't want that to happen with garments. So instead we use a back stitch and that really seals it off so that it can't come undone. So to perform the reverse stitch and seal things off, all you have to do is do a couple of stitches forward and then a couple of stitches in reverse and then a couple of stitches forward and continue on with your seam. In uni, I think I was taught to do four back tack stitches, but nowadays I generally do two. So here you can see two versus the one in the middle and none on the right hand side. And it just seals things off and makes it so much easier because you don't have to tie a knot at every single seam. So you do this when you begin sewing a seam and when you finish sewing a seam so that both ends are nice and closed off and it saves you having to tie a knot every single time. So hopefully it's helpful to see all these different little lines, the different ways that we can adjust our settings. It really is a case of changing one thing at a time. If you pull out your um, fabric and your stitches look horrible, the last thing you want to do is go and change all of your settings all at once and then test it again, because then there's no way of knowing which setting was causing the problem in the first place. So whenever you're troubleshooting, whenever your stitches look a little bit wrong or something's just not quite right, change one thing first test it again and see if that helped. If it did help, great, then you're like on your way to fixing that problem. If it didn't help, then you change it back to the, what it was and then try to change a different setting. So for example, with all of my lines of stitching as I was going along, each time I changed the tension a tiny little bit and then I tested it again, changed it a tiny bit more, tried it again, and so on and so forth. So whenever you're adjusting something, always a tiny bit at a time. Now that you know how to thread up your machine and do all of the basics um, in how to work your machine, the best thing I can recommend to do next to expand on your sewing skills is unfortunately not very exciting, but it really is what helps to improve. It's to sew straight lines. So when I was in uni, our sewing teacher basically made us sew I think lengths of fabric, about 
maybe one meter or more in length and they were skinny like this and you just had to sew straight. You can practice sewing one centimeter, uh, six mil and basically the goal is to just continue straight down that line until you've got really good control of your machine. You know how to operate the foot pedal, you know when you can go a bit faster, when you need to slow down and how to begin with a little back tack and how to end with a little back tack. Those are really key skills when it comes to sewing and so that would be my next little tip for you. Having done all that, I really hope that you've found some confidence in using your machine. Um, as I said, most machines are very similar these days and I hope that this was helpful for you. The key to improving from a beginner sewer to getting a bit more confident and doing more difficult projects really is practice. The more you expose yourself to different types of seams, different garments, different types of fabric, the more um, your sewing knowledge will expand and the more you'll be able to tackle more difficult projects. It's extremely satisfying when you can confidently handle a sewing machine. So I really hope that this inspires you to try one out, to practice and to have some fun. Do give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful and also leave a comment or any questions if you encountered any problems when you were going through the process with me, I would do my best to help you out. If you would like to see more videos on how to sew some basics, how to mend things as well, head over to my channel and consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in another video soon.